Hey, it's good to be with you. Thanks for dialing in. My name is Ken Nabby. I am the regional president of Converge Great Lakes up in Wisconsin in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And I'm here to talk with you today about effectively passing the baton of leadership or what uh, technically we call succession planning. I, I was a pastor at one church only for 21 years. I started out as the associate pastor, then I became the executive pastor, and then I served as a senior pastor for 12 years. And about six uh, years ago, I stepped down from that position into this one. And in the course of that process, we contacted our denominational association to ask for some help and guidance on passing the baton. And, uh, and that process was kind of frustrating, to be honest with you, because we weren't really ready and prepared as a church. And so uh, we were able to find an, uh, an effective interim pastor that served the church. And, and within a year or so, they had uh, found a new senior pastor. And then a year after that, I was able to return to my own church where I'd been for 21 years and have been there supporting the existing senior pastor as the former senior pastor. It's very unusual, but it's gone very, very well. And in that process, I have learned a great deal about succession planning. And in particular, in my role now as a regional denominational leader, I work with churches all the time about how to put together a baton passing process. And that's what I want to talk with you about today. It's so crucial because if we do it poorly, often it takes the church years to recover. If we do it well, the church cannot skip a beat and move forward. You know, the, the average church has to develop a, a succession plan. No matter its size, no matter the process, it needs to be able to think about how we're going to pass the baton from one leader to the next. I just spoke with uh, a lead pastor not that long ago who said to me, Ken, I know more about the future of my church and what it needs to do than I do about my own career as a pastor. And that's actually not uncommon. There's a wonderful book called The Elephant in the Boardroom, written by uh, Weiss and Crabtree. And they have this great opening line in the first chapter, which basically says, every pastor is an interim pastor. And what that really means is that at some point you're going to go, if you're a pastor, whether it's a senior or executive or associate or some other role, at some point you're going to need to leave. And the church needs to think about that. The board needs to prepare for that, even if it's years out and away. We wanna make sure that we do that. So what I'd like to do in the remainder of our time is define succession planning, what it, what it really looks like to pass that baton. I wanna note the things uh, that need to happen in order for that change to be successful. And I wanna review some common practices that are really, really helpful if local churches will pay attention to this. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to define a succession planning. When I first began doing research on this a couple of years ago, my definition of succession planning was way too narrow. I just thought it only was when the senior pastor handed the baton to the incoming new senior pastor, and that was it. But really, succession planning is much broader than that. Succession planning is this. It's the process by which power and influence are passed from one outgoing leader to a new incoming leader. That incoming leader could be an interim pastor, could be somebody rising up from within the congregation. It could be a new senior pastor that's brought on for a time and a season of overlap. The planning must be documented. You'll hear me say that several times. It's really important to make sure that the outgoing leader knows what their role is, the board knows what its role is, and the incoming leader knows what they're to do. The more clarity there is, the better. Every church, I believe, should have a written succession plan, a document that's been developed, communicated, and understood so that when that time comes, you're ready. Uh, briefly speaking, there are three different types of succession. The first one is what we call a forced uh, planned departure. That is, it's an emergency. We had to let somebody go. Uh, somebody gets terminated or uh, there's an abrupt departure for whatever set of reason. And no longer are, um, are these kind of issues because of uh, you know, just a sinful failure, but sometimes it's chemistry fit, it's, it's a gifting skill and those kind of things, it just depends. So forced departures are part of what we need to think about. We need to uh, ask questions around severance pay and those kind of things. George Barna says 
that only 17% of departures, succession plannings, only 17% are actually planned. And that upwards of almost 10% now are routinely being forced. That, that is, pastors are either being asked to resign or terminated. In my six years as a denominational leader, unfortunately, I have had to um, guide churches through terminations because of plagiarism, embezzlement, uh, uh, sinful patterns as it relates to leadership and abuse, and even uh, uh, serial infidelity and those kind of things. So we're seeing forced departures occur more often than maybe we care, really care to admit. I wrote a book actually as a, as a helpful guide. It's called uh, Leading Through and Preparing for uh, Pastoral Failure. And I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it's, it's what are you going to do? Are you going to help people um, after they're departed for those reasons? You're going to provide counseling dollars? Is there severance pay qu uh, questions? What about restoration plans? If somebody has kids, are they going to have to relocate? All those kind of things. So here's the truth. If you're a board member, if you're a senior pastor, if you're, if you're a, a lay leader in a church, if you're another staff uh, person, most likely, given the statistics in the next five to 10 years, you're likely going to have to walk through some type of forced uh, planned departure. And so I just want to encourage you to be ready for that. If you have this written down, it will help you walk through that, pro uh, that process. The succession plan gives you the guidance. Now, let's talk about the second one, which is the unplanned uh, departure, the unplanned succession process. And this is by far the majority of what happens in the church. Way too often, pastors will uh, feel an, an unease or an unrest. They go out, they don't tell anybody, they're looking for job postings, they find a job, they apply. They go and even candidate, they accept the job and then come back and then they tell their board by giving a 30 day notice, maybe sometimes 40 or 60 day notice. And the, and the church is instantly thrust into kind of a panic response mode. Who, who's gonna do what? And do we have to have a party? And how are we gonna make things happen? This kind of departure often wounds a congregation. It's not uncommon for uh, unplanned departures like this to lose 10, 15, sometimes 20% of the congregation uh, attendance and membership. It's, it's a painful process. And even if there's a relief that that pastor is going, uh, maybe you're kind of glad that that pastor has taken off, there's still things that need to be sorted through. What about a party to help them leave well? Is, are there severance or parting gift plans or a love offering or things like that? Figuring out who's going to do what. In smaller churches especially, it's really helpful to bring in outside resources to guide you and help you, reaching out to a denominational association or some person like that. So the third category is the planned departure. And this is the one that we're really uh, most focused on in this session. This is where there's actually a plan that's been written, developed. It's, it's understood by the leadership and the staff. It's been communicated to the congregation. They know that at some point, uh, when our pastor leaves, there's a plan. And nobody's saying the pastor has to go right now, but when he or she does go, we're ready. And uh, generally speaking, it takes about two years to really work this process through well, to research it, write it, confirm it, get a sense of, of uh, uh, God's blessing of it, communicating that to the congregation and getting it finalized. Every church needs to develop a written succession plan. So a couple things about that in preparation for that. So uh, when to initiate uh, a, a, sex, a succession plan. So first of all, personal self-assessment is really, really crucial. I'm going to catch up on my slides here because I, I bounced over a few. There we go. So um, you don't want to develop your succession plan or enter into this self-assessment process on the Monday morning blues. You know, pastors often on Monday morning uh, wonder about their effectiveness or their, their fruitfulness, and they sometimes they, they just wanna quit and they wanna go away. That's not the right time, and that's not the kind of self-assessment we're talking about. The kind of assessment that I'm suggesting is based upon an intentional process of review. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What areas of effectiveness are you seeing occur? And where are you frustrated? Where is the church 
not growing? And how do your staff respond to you and those kinds of things? Our denomination, Converge, actually offers a retreat. We call it Compass, and it's a chance for a, a pastor and their spouse to get away for a four-day intentional process. It's a group cohort process to look in the mirror, reflect, review, understand what your strengths are, your weaknesses, and really look at the ministry and scope of your life. One pastor recently said to me um, that, that he knew more about his ministry than he did about his own personal life. And, you know, what a, what a shock and a tragedy. And he's going to go check out this Compass retreat so he can really look in the mirror and figure some things out. There are a few basic questions for self-reflection that every pastor needs to ask. Uh, what's your own personal sense of satisfaction? Are you working out of your strengths? Do you enjoy the people that you work with? Have you accomplished the things that you think God has called you to accomplish? What level of frustration or fruitfulness or stagnation are you experiencing when you think about uh, your ministry and so forth? And so we want to encourage you to, to do this kind of self-reflection as a part of it. Personal self-assessment is the first step in all of this. And so we want to, uh, from that, we want to talk about five key factors that precede having this discussion with your board or with your board chairman. So first of all, there's a sense of God's will. I, I love the, um, the passage in 1 Kings 17 where Elijah goes and he is, um, God tells him to go uh, to the Kirath Ravine and, and crows are going to bring him food and he can drink water from the, uh, the brook. But in verse 7, 1 Kings 17, 7, it says the brook dried up. And that was God's way of readying him to move to a different location. And I think sometimes in ministry, when we do the, the reflection, we discover that the brook of passion has dried up and we're not as excited about what it is that God has called us to. Would Elijah have moved if the water was still flowing and the crows were still bringing him food? Probably not. And so a good question is, has the river in your own heart of passion and focus dried up? Another really good question to ask is about uh, financial practices. So uh, financial security, I mean, H how is your own personal financial life? Are you, um, we don't talk about this very openly, but are, are pastors, like, are you ready for whatever the next phase is financially? Can you handle a transition in income and employment and those kinds of things? Many pastors feel underpaid and some churches don't pay their pastors well. Churches need to develop a fair process for a fair wage so that a pastor can engage in this process and figure things out. The next one is marital unity, really trying to uh, make sure that your spouse is with you. If you're looking to relocate, that doesn't just affect you and your career, but it, it, it affects your entire family. So where's your spouse at? And what are they feeling and thinking about the future of the ministry there at the church? Another good question is, are there future opportunities for the pastor to consider as it relates to uh, their, uh, if they step down, what's next? If they're looking at retirement, but they don't feel like they're done, when uh, uh, can they find new opportunities, whether it's as pulpit fill or coaching or interim pastoring or those kinds of things? And so uh, asking yourself, are there other opportunities that you can look forward to? And then finally, the the last piece is a posture of humility. Underneath the healthy readiness uh, to step down or step away is a commitment to humility. An outgoing pastor must be humble. They must be secure. They can't let their ego get tangled up in the, in the process of letting someone else come in behind them and lead a change. So just a few thoughts on succession planning and the scripture, and I think this is uh, uh, worth some further exploration if you wanted, but if you studied the life of Paul and his relationship with Timothy, there's all kinds of amazing things going on there from a succession planning preparation. Read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and look and see, and you'll discover that there are a number of things going on that Paul is doing to prepare Timothy as his uh, a protege that's going to follow him in leadership. I've discovered five, and I'll just uh, line these off for you real quick. The first one is that Paul taught Timothy the importance of doctrine and to lead with theological clarity, theological clarity around the gospel. Second, 
Paul kept reminding Timothy that he had a call, that people had laid hands on him and, and the Spirit had confirmed a call and a sense of purpose. Third, Paul gave Timothy real ministry opportunity. There were problems in the church in Ephesus and he was guiding him on how to do that. Timothy, you go fix these issues. Fourth, Paul routinely modeled Christian leadership and Christian character so that Timothy could see what, what mature leadership looked like. Fifth and finally, Paul encouraged Timothy multiple times. He, he, Timothy seemed to require encouragement, just uh, uh, reminding him that he had a purpose and God had given him a call. That's worth some further digging when you have some time. It's a fascinating study. So six essential practices in succession planning that I wanna uh, make sure you get right now. So first is there needs to be an organizational self-assessment. Once the clergy, the pastor's already done self-assessment, the church needs to do an organizational self-assessment. That it, You could facilitate a SWOT analysis. What are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? You could engage in a natural church development survey and measuring the, your church health or any number of other processes to understand where are we strong? How able is our church? This will help you guide when you think about hiring a new or next lead pastor in particular. Know what you're good at, know what you're strong at, and know where you're weak and you need to develop. I encourage pastors to depersonalize this process because sometimes what you might discover in that self-assessment is that there are things that the pastor's not doing well. And so, the pastors, you have to depersonalize this. And it's, it's critical that your ego doesn't get tangled up in the way. There are governance issues that sometimes that need to be considered in this kind of self-assessment process. That is, what does your constitution and bylaws say about how a search committee is formed or a new senior pastor is found? You need to make sure that those things can line up with an intentional succession plan of either bringing in an interim or hiring a new person that you pass the baton to that's an internal candidate or something like that. Review your governance documents. You have to ask yourself, can we afford a transition? How is our financial stability? And can we put these things together? Often you have uh, an existing outgoing senior pastor and a new incoming senior pastor, both on payroll at the same time. If there's a severance gift, that might go on for months and months. And can we afford that kind of transition? It's really good to make sure you do that. Don't just look for somebody who's like the existing senior pastor. It's the number one mistake lots of churches make. Figure out who we are, where we believe God is calling us to go, and then what kind of leader can get us there. Second key is to write the plan down. I've already said it several times. I love Acts 15, the, the Jerusalem council. They get together, the, the apostles, the church elders, the leaders are there, and they write down their decision, and then they communicate it to the churches, and the churches rejoice. They have a chance to respond, please make sure that you write down whatever it is that you formulate so that it can then be communicated to the congregation. And that's the third point, communicate across the church. So the church knows that there's a plan in motion, that, that whenever we have to enter into this process, we'll have a plan that we can deal with. The fourth is to pace the succession process. The larger the church, the more intentional you need to be. The, the larger and more complex, uh, complex the staff team, the more deliberate, maybe even the slower you have to go in this process. I said to you earlier, it takes about two years to really write and develop and get a good succession plan in place and understood and ready to be implemented when that person is ready to depart. Pace the succession. Fifth, uh, there's the importance of prayer through it all making sure that your congregation is praying when you enter into the su uh, succession process, you're asking them to pray. The congregate, congregants want to know what's going on. And one of the ways that you can engage them is to encourage them to pray. Sixth and finally, I, I wanna suggest to you that the single most important factor in a succession plan being successful is the outgoing leader. Is the outgoing leader humble? Are they willing to, to not have their ego be stroked in the process? Can they let somebody else step into the light and be successful? Are they able to be boundaried and empowering and selfless and secure? The outgoing senior pastor will define whether a succession plan 
is going to be fruitful or not. I do have additional resources that uh, that could be helpful to you if you want to consider that. Uh, if you want to email me at knabby at convergegreatlakes.org, I'll happily share a sample policy that you could look at or even a paper that I wrote on succession planning. But whatever you do, make sure you get ready for this process. Thank you.